And now, we welcome you to the Sanctuary of the Potter's House for a sure word. Psalm 85, I'm going to read it from the New International Version, then the book of Joel, chapter 2, um, I think from the New King James, or the King James Version of the Bible. But the book of Psalm, chapter 85, um, I want to read that, uh, and then Joel, chapter 2, and they are related, they correlate. Psalm 85, 6. Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your unfailing love, O Lord, and grant or give us your salvation. And then in the book of Joel, chapter 2, verse 28, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy your old men shall dream dreams your young men shall see visions and also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit and I will show wonders in heaven and in the earth blood and fire and pillars of smoke Verse 28, it shall come to pass that I will come and pour out my spirit on all flesh. I want to share with you from the topic what to expect when revival hits God's people. What to expect when revival hits God's people. Father, thank you now. Amen. I have, of course, preached, even at the turn of this new year, even after the horrific last year that so many people experienced, I preached and prophesied about a coming revival. I prophesied that in 2021, and how soon we forget, that we're going to need to be filled with the Holy Ghost. I said that this would be the year of the Holy Spirit, that we would need to be filled and filled and filled. It was just a couple of weeks ago that I preached from uh, the topic, the message, Lord, your people need reviving. I said that message, what uh, your people, Lord, your people need reviving. I thought I would have the topic and the sermon thing itself when I speak and when I say revival I'm in essence speaking synonymously about the moving of the Holy Spirit or the moving of the Spirit of God on and in the lives of the people of God our Psalm 85 text says will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you I believe that when we talk of this coming revival, uh, this revival that will occur in the earth, I believe it's safe to say that it is tied to the promise of Joel chapter 2. And Peter reminds us of it as he quotes it in Acts 2 on the day of Pentecost. In Acts 2, verse 1, you remember these words. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire. And it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. So when the Spirit of God moved, there was a marked change. Something happened to the people of God. They were all filled, and they began to behave differently. So on the day of Pentecost, when the Spirit here is literally poured out on these people in that room, that upper room, when asked to explain it, here's what Peter said. 
They said, what's wrong with these people? Peter says in Acts 2, 15, for these are not drunkard. These are not drunk, as you suppose. Seeing it is but the third hour of the day, just 9 o'clock in the morning. Now, unless you're from the north side and used to riding through Max Mustang Lounge, you ain't drunk. Verse 16, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see vision, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens, I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. So Peter quotes Joel, this day of Pentecost, this physical outpouring of the Holy Spirit, this manifestation of the Spirit of God moving in the lives of people that's causing people uh, that have come from all over the world to reckon that there's something different about them. Peter equates it to Joel's prophecy. So let it be known. Uh, this promise of this outpouring with the same type of signs and wonders that started on the day of Pentecost is the same promise that we can expect in our generation and in generations to come. How do I know? I'm glad you asked. Peter says in Acts 2.39, for the promise is unto you and to your children and to how many? All that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Because the prophecy of Joel ends by saying, and whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Uh, the psalmist writes in Psalm 85 and says, God revive us and give us your salvation. So calling on the name of the Lord while the spirit of the Lord is moving will grant you salvation, deliverance, wholeness, power, strength to endure the journey. God's promise of this outpouring is called by Peter times of refreshing from the Lord. Times when the Holy Ghost will supernaturally strengthen you like I need him to do in me today. Times when the Holy Ghost will supernaturally console you, for he is the comforter and he has come. Times when a supernatural move of God will come upon you to remind you that God is with you. Times of quickening and times of strengthening. Times when you woke up and you felt like you wanted to lay back down, but about halfway through the day you realized that if it had not been for the Lord, that it was God who gives you strength. It is God who encourages you and helps you. You think I'm just preaching. No, 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 I'm not just preaching. I believe this. I'm not just preaching about this. I believe this. This is my testimony. I have seen God. I can testify that the Holy Ghost has helped me, comforted me, held my hand, got me right when I was going wrong kept the devil off of my case, covered me. Y'all not helping me, kept me from my enemy. Y'all not helping me, put a hedge about me, saved my very life, spoke to me, said turn this way and that way, said go home, said turn around, said put it down, said turn it off. I'm telling you the Holy Ghost has a way of getting a hold of them that he loves and those that love God, I believe this. This is not something that I heard about. This is something I live every day of my life. And by the way, there is a devil. And he's busy. He's moving all over the land. And he's still walking to and fro, seeking whom he may devour. From the White House to the Poor House, the deaf angel is still riding. The devil is still walking about, seeking whom he may devour. But way down in my sanctified soul, I still feel in my spirit 
that it's revival time. And I still believe in my spirit that God is still moving. God is still on the throne. So let me help you to understand my take on this message. It was about five years ago that I made this statement in the message, and I quote myself. And I said, if your heart is right with God, and if you are in right relationship with God, you need to know that your best days are ahead of you. I remember speaking that in the service, and I remember everybody just went up when I said, your best days are ahead of you. Because as you read the scriptures, you'll find something that appears to conflict with what our eyes see, that appears to conflict with this present age, that appears to conflict with our current condition as people on this planet because these are dark and perilous times. These are evil days. Yet, the Bible declares that there's a promise, come on man, go with me, of better days. That there's something called latter rain. That there's something called the glory of the latter house. There's something called more glorious than anything that we've seen in the past. There's something called better days, and better days are coming. Now, if you go back to my quote of five years ago, you may notice a couple of things about that promise. Did you notice in that quote that I said, if and if? If and if. Number one, I said, if your heart is right with God. All right, here we go. And number two, I said, if you're in a right relationship with God. Yeah, then and only then can you expect better days. Then and only then can you hold on to that promise and believe that God is going to work it out for you. In other words, I guess I'm trying to say, if you ain't saved for real, this ain't about you. If you ain't saved for real, matter of fact, you ain't even feeling me right now. I'm going to do a salvation test on y'all right now. Some of y'all sitting there like a gator by the lake or like a water on a pickle with your arms folded and your eyes rolled up in your back of your head waiting on something for you, waiting on a blessing, waiting on me to tell you that it's going to be all right, that God's going to send you a check and mail, another stimulus check, that God's going to make a mistake, the government is, and you're going to be doubly blessed and don't know that after a while you're going to have to pay it back. They're going to get it back. You just don't have no idea about that. But what I'm trying to say is that there's so many people who ain't really saved and they wind up in the house of God and I made that statement saying if your heart ain't right with God and if you don't have a right relationship with God you can't even see what I'm saying right now you'd be amazed that as complimentary as I've been about the things of God right now and as encouraging I think as I've been and informative as I've been so far uh, to the people of God right now there's some people who don't like me there's some people who are online right now who will drop off because it ain't what they want to hear. There are people who sign off and go find something else. Paul said they heap to themselves teachers because they have itching ears. They'll turn away from the truth and they'll turn to fables. They'd rather believe a lie than the truth. They'll say, don't tell us about this God stuff. Say to us smooth things. Tell us what we like, what we want to hear. You have people that come to the house of God and that's what they do. They sit here and wait on their message as if God ain't talking to them right now will wait on something that has something to do with their particular condition and don't know that your particular condition all hinges upon your heart being right with God and having a right relationship with God because when your heart is right with God and you have a right relationship with God your current condition don't mean dooley squat it don't matter to you about what's going on in your life right now when God is in your life right now and ahead of your life right now because God's got your back. So let me try to prove it to you. I want to I wanna prove it to you. If your heart ain't right, uh, then you can't comprehend my testimony and my commentary so far. It don't and won't make sense to you even in a minute. So let me prove it. Right now, let me talk to some saved folk. Those whose hearts are right with God. And those who are in a right relationship with God, if you're in here, say amen. Yeah. Uh -huh. Listen, say folk, regardless of what it looks like, God is moving. Yeah. 
Say, folk, we walk by faith and not by sight. Sean Williams, your boo and my son Tony is in ICU on a ventilator. And I'm telling you, God is moving. Come on. I'm telling y'all, when Felicia had COVID and then had a stroke, God was moving. When COVID crept into our country and shut us down, I just want to tell you, God was moving. When folk were marching about systemic everything and it looked like a civil war was inevitable, I'm just here to tell y'all that God was moving. When Donald Trump was in the White House, God was moving. When Joe Biden moved into the White House, God's still moving. God is never dormant. He's always moving. Second Chronicles 16, 9 puts it best. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in behalf of them whose heart is perfect towards him. Y'all missed it. His eyes run to and fro. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere. He sees all things. And he's just looking for somebody to show himself strong in the behalf of. But look what he's looking at. Somebody whose heart is perfect towards him come on somebody whose heart is right with him y'all not helping me he's looking for somebody that will let him move he's looking for somebody i told y'all that is willing to be used he's also looking for somebody who needs a move and they aren't perfect david wasn't perfect but david was a man after god's own heart all you got to do is have a right heart all you got to do is have a circumcision of your heart. All you got to do is have a new heart. All you got to do is be born again. All you got to do is be regenerated. All you got to do is be saved. All you got to do is be born again. Come on, talk to me. All you got to do is be a real child of God. And while I'm thinking about this, you know what I'm thinking about, baby? I'm thinking about Pastor Sharon Dean. Uh, I'm thinking about Sharon Dean. How many of y'all remember Pastor Sharon? Oh, she's a part of our fellowship, covering the fellowship. She come in, she's preached for us many times. Her and her husband visited Jacksonville for another conference and was using the youth church in the back with Bishop Garns. And they wound up after the conference stepping in here and help. her husband saw me and said, that's the man that preached up in Jersey. That time I've been looking for him ever since I found my father and all this kind of stuff. And they became family. And Sharon has ministered for us, and over and over they co-pastored the church there in, in New Jersey, the greater New York area there. Well, I'm thinking about Pastor Sharon because four years ago, she was dead in the water. Yeah, her and her husband, after 29 years of marriage, got a divorce. A dynamic duo, two preaching machines ripped apart. Her children got dismayed with the church and began questioning the things of God. And uh, here she is now, singled and confused. She was, she was messed up. But she's got good roots, though, because she's from a line of, of servants of God, people who have survived and been through some things. So she got up out of the New York area and packed up and moved down south. Yeah, from New York. Why would you go, anyway, from New York? She moved to hide. She moved to recoup. She moved and she uh, was hired on staff and served on staff at one of the largest churches in the state of North Carolina. Ain't God good? A 122-year-old local church renowned in the city of Raleigh. So just this past Friday and yesterday even, I mean all day, Pastor Sharon toured my wife and I along with many other persons from New York area and around the country that were there with her in New York and she's preached for around the country and uh, for the first time they laid eyes on where her trauma and where her journey had taken her. We all cared about it. We all loved it. I couldn't wait to go and see where she had landed. Well, the tour literally <laughs> wore us out. Almost 200,000 square feet of facilities second to none anywhere in the country beautiful in the suburbs of Raleigh she had landed in a wealthy place 
At least God had made room for her. But I couldn't believe uh, that God had opened a door for her uh, to serve on a staff at a church like this. That larger ministry, after all she had been through, I'm thinking about qualifications, I'm thinking about divorce, all of that stuff. But after her divorce, after her many defections, after betrayal, after her struggles, after struggles mentally and financially and emotionally, starting all over again, and after struggles even spiritually, it was powerful to see where she had landed. Some folk thought she was done, but when y'all look at God, he was looking for somebody whose heart was perfect towards him. Not perfect, but whose heart was perfect towards him. But I ain't telling y'all everything. I'm deliberately keeping something from you. So let me give you the punchline. I wasn't in North Carolina for Sharon to show me the church that she left everything she knows and loves to go and be on staff as an assistant to uh, the pastor. I wasn't there to have a pity party and help her lick her wounds because of how the enemy had attacked her and her family. For the record, I was there as one of three bishops to help install Sharon Dean as the new senior pastor. Put that on the screen. Of the Wake Chapel Church in Raleigh, North Carolina, one of the largest churches in the state of North Carolina. She is now the first woman senior pastor in the 122 year history of the church there in North Carolina. I wish I had some help in this room. So what am I saying? I'm saying when Sharon Dean was divorced, God was moving. When she was lonely and confused, God was moving. When she loaded up a U-Haul and headed south and didn't know what she was doing and where she was going, I how long she was going to be there, God was moving. Y'all not helping me here. It does not matter what you're going through, where you are right now, what it looks like in the natural. It doesn't matter what the people have written you off. It does not matter. God is moving. I need about 55 people to throw your head back and reach way down and shout in here. But hold on, that's Pastor Sharon testimony. I can testify myself. Before I got saved, God was moving in my life. When I got saved and walked off my job, God was moving. When I was selling blood and full-time ministry to feed my family, God was moving. When I was catching the bus with an inspired, expired bus pass to go and preach at churches in this city, God was moving. When I was splitting the elder shot up a crystal burger on Riverside Avenue, trying to get a little something, something to eat, you had 36. And I had four cents, and we split that crystal burger right down to the middle. Good God Almighty, God was moving. When I didn't own a suit and was preaching every day, I didn't even have a suit. I didn't even own a tie. Y'all out helping me here, and was preaching my guts out. God was moving. When I was preaching in shacks by the tracks, God was moving. When I was preaching downtown on onion crates, picking up homeless people, bringing them home, putting them in my own bed in my own house God was moving when I was pastoring the traditional Baptist church in Green Coast Springs God was moving when I resigned and didn't know what I was going to do and wound up starting this ministry God was moving we moved from seaboard to Lane from Lane to Normandy from Lane and Normandy down to Normandy Mall and we're here today and I'm here to tell you that God is still moving you got saved Good God, uh, for real, if you really got saved, uh, for real, you can appreciate uh, what I'm talking about. But if you ain't really saved, uh, jealousy will rise up in you. If you ain't really saved, you'll say, well, what that got to do with me? Don't you know that you're in this room today because God was moving? Don't you know that if God hadn't done in me what he did in me, you wouldn't even be in this place today? So you can't be here loving other people more than you love me. You got to be in this house knowing that God is moving. If you're saved, 
you understand what I'm saying. You see, there's just too many people in the church that just don't have a testimony. Yeah, can't go through nothing. Lord, have mercy. Just easily offended about nothing. Don't know how we got here. Just show up and just crazy about nothing. Quick even to doubt God and the plan of God after God meticulously placed you here in the care of people who love him and love the people. There are people who prove that they got relational problems and heart problems when they're quick uh, to give up on a ministry. Uh, hop around quick to talk about all that's wrong in a ministry, but do nothing to contribute to helping make things right in a, in a ministry. I still believe that there are just too many people hanging around the church that's given the church a bad name. People are in church, but they're not in Christ. Shouting in here and doing shady stuff out there. Dancing in here and acting the fool out there. Serving in here and stuck up and stuck on themselves out there. Singing in here and still savage. That boy was savage. Out there in them streets. Preaching in here and perverted out there. Folk are giving us a bad name. I believe because uh, they ain't saved. I believe that there's a heart problem and a relationship problem. What proof do I have? Uh, no faith. The just, we live by faith. They have no trust in God. They don't respond to stuff and trials like they ought to. Folk that are truly saved ha have this way of trusting in the Lord regardless. I'm going a, I'm to a, I'm a trail him where I can't trace him. I, I, I'm going to keep going even if I don't see where I'm going. He's my true north, and I'm just going to follow him. Uh, let me give you an example. Last night, flight attendant uh, offered to serve us up front because they were expecting turbulence, a bumpy ride. My wife, had, she was busy doing what she had to do. The lady had to bend down and say, ma'am, I'm saying, do you need something to drink right now? My wife was like, what? Something to drink right now. Turbulence are ahead of us. It's going to be a bumpy ride. We're not going to be able to serve once we get off the ground. Then the pilot came on and said, I'm going to let you know, everyone, I'm Captain so-and-so, that there's a front moving through. And this flight is going to be rough. We wound up delayed over five hours because of the weather. Then the pilot said again, this was comforting to me as a safe, I mean a frequent flyer. He said, but don't worry. The rough ride is normal when conditions are like they are. The pilot said, don't worry. And then he said something more powerful than that because for some people that wasn't good enough. Even for me, I was still a little skeptical. So he said, I'm not worried about the flight. So I don't want any of you to be worried either. He said, I've been here, done this. You have no reason to be afraid. Now, the only people that could appreciate his comments were the saved. I mean, were the folk who had flown before. Everybody else was still scared to death. And every time we hit a turbulent, they cringed. Every bump, they, 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 they hollered. One little boy was just, ah, ah, and just hollering, just acting just like somebody whose heart was not right. And somebody who didn't have a relationship with, the, with God. And so he was just screaming. But when you ain't really say, when you ain't really a frequent fire, turbulence will mess you up. 
What am I saying? If you're a true God, child of God, let me be your pilot just for a moment. I've been flying for a while. I've been through some things. Here's what you can expect if you're going to live this life. You can expect disappointments. You can expect marital issues. You can expect an assault on your health. You can expect an assault on your wealth. You can expect an assault on your children. You can expect an assault on your children's health. You can expect to be discriminated against. You can expect to be hated. You can expect to be lied on. You can expect to be betrayed. You can expect to be misunderstood. You can expect to be misjudged. You can expect these things. Come on, talk to me here. Don't sit there looking at me like that when every one of these things are your testimony. you got to believe and somebody's got to agree with you that it's going to be alright regardless of what you're going to go through. Because Just hold on. I promise you, some of us have been here. We've done that. We've got the t-shirt. Our children are healed now. Our marriages are back together now. We got our job back, our money back, our mind back, our health back. Come on, talk to me here. Life is not a flowery bed of ease. You don't get saved and go to heaven. You get saved and go through hell. You got to go through hell before you go to heaven. Even Jesus went down in the hell, took the keys of death, hell, and the grave. If Jesus had to go through hell, you're going to have to go through hell yourself. When you're saved, you need to understand that the devil is your enemy, not your homeboy. Just like your natural homeboys try to get you back, smoke a little weed, drink a little liqueur, and do some of the things y'all used to do. The devil knows your Achilles heel. The devil can get you all by yourself. Devil will have you ordering stuff on Amazon. Discreetly packaged. Hello, testing. When you're saved, you need to understand that God is your father and not somebody who's trying to cramp your style. When you're saved, you understand that. When you're saved, you need to know that when God uses a preacher for correction and discipline, it's not to harm you, it's to help you. Yeah, when, when God points something out and, and it's as candid, as he needs to be towards you. He ain't trying to crimp your style. He's, he's trying to help you. So many people try to make living for God so hard. They just don't, they don't understand, I believe, what it means to be saved. I, I say this and people don't get it. You'll get it later. I say, you can't get saved wrong and live right. You, you got to understand salvation. I'm going to preach myself. <laughs> Jesus makes an appeal to people. Who needed salvation and here's what he says it's called the great invitation Matthew 11 28 come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest take my yoke upon you and learn of me for I'm meek and lowly in heart and you shall find rest unto your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light hallelujah can you imagine coming to God and somebody share that with you emphatically. Let me put the hay down where the ghost can bid it, get it and read it to you from the message. It's pretty close. It's not all that, but it gives you a greater depth. Matthew eleven twenty eight. Are you tired? Sound like a commercial, right? Stop there. Are you tired? Having trouble sleeping at night? We have just a thing for you. Take two of these at bedtime. One at noon and watch how it works. And then it ends with the potential side effects are <laughs> headache, back ache, stomach ache, cancer, high blood pressure, sugar diabetes. You know you're from the hood when you say sugar diabetes. <laughs> you just said the same thing twice. What you got, sugar diabetes? What kind of other diabetes is it? How many of y'all got the sugar diabetes? 
Here's what he says, verse number 28. Are you tired, worn out, burnt out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me, and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Come on, this is how we do it. Jesus said, watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Glory be to God. Unforced rhythms of grace. The first book I read outside of the Bible was a book called The Rhythm of Life. It was by Richard Exley, and it talked about living through Christ, Christ working through you, Christ in you, the hope of glory. It was not supposed to be hard, according to Jesus, for people to live saved. It was not even supposed to be hard for people to get saved. As many as receive him, to them gave me power to become the sons of God. Matter of fact, being saved is supposed to be exciting. John 10, 10, he said, the thief comes not but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy, but I come that they might have life, that you might have it more abundantly. He's come to give us an exciting life so that we can live the abundant life, exceeding abundant life, exceeding, exceeding abundantly above all we can ask or think. Just like my flight last night, I walk with God is filled with turbulence, is filled with difficulties after we are saved, after we board the plane. But keep in mind, it's all good if you let Jesus be your pilot. The unfold, old folk put it like this. They say, let go and let God. Baby, let go. Hey, let go and let God. Uh, is there anybody here that has chosen to let go and let God? I did it. I did it day one of my salvation. The day I got saved, I got a revelation directly from God. I got a revelation, and I realized that I did not do anything to save myself. And I learned later that I can't do anything to keep myself. I learned that if God don't keep me, I won't be kept. Notice what I said because it went right across the top of your head because that's what many people falter. You thought you did good. You thought you stopped doing some things. Just like right now. You think you're better than somebody because of the effort that you put forth. When Jesus intended that invitation in Matthew 28, he says, come if you're tired of religion, if you're tired of works righteousness, if you're tired of trying to do it yourself, or if you've got trust in yourself, don't do that. Come to me. And so a lot of people still don't understand that salvation starts with God, not with you. There's nothing you can do to prep your relationship with God. There's nothing that you can do to get right with God before God chooses to be right with you. God makes choice. I'm about to preach myself. God heard my cry for help and he helped me. God saw me sinking in sin, far from the peaceful shore. I was deeply stained within, sinking the rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry, and from the waters he lifted me. Now safe am I. God heard my cry for help, and he helped me. I didn't choose God. You didn't choose God. God chose me and God chose you. If you're saved, you didn't choose God. God chose you. And if you love God, remember, you love God because he first loved you with your crazy self. How God committed his love towards us that while we were acting the fool, while we were yet sinners, while we were crazy as all get out, God committed his love towards us that while we were crazy, while we were sinning, while we were acting the fool, Christ died. He sent his son to die for us. Not when you had it together, but when you were totally messed up. Not when you had it all right and now you're ready to walk the aisle. No, some of us walked the aisle full of weed. Some of us walked the aisle full of liquor. Some of us walked the aisle smelling like a night before. Some of us walked the aisle and we still
still were bound. We had chains on us when we got to an altar, when we kneeled down on our knees. Some of us, I'm trying to preach somebody into just a remembrance of how good God was to you because you weren't willing to give it up. You weren't trying to give it up. You were doing your own thing, minding your own business. You were sneaky with it. Come on, you were sneaky with it. I'm going to get somebody. There you go. You were sneaky with it. Nobody really knew what you really were going through in your mind, in your body. Nobody really knew how much pain you were enduring. And God looked right at you and said, I love you anyhow. I love you with your crazy self. I love you with your lying self. I love you with your sneaky self. I love you. I love you with your drunken self. I love you. I love you. I love you with an everlasting love. I love you. I love you with everything in me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whoever believes on him wouldn't perish but have everlasting life. God commended his love towards us. There it is that while we were sinning Christ died and greater love and no man than this that he'll lay down his life for his friends. God laid his life down in the person of Jesus Christ. He shed his blood and without the shedding of blood there's no remission of sin but when he shed his blood he set every man free. He died not just for us but for the sins of the world and whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Somebody throw your head back, reach straight down and shout. The Lord is going to use us. I shared with you last week that God is creating an atmosphere for revival. I said that we are atmosphere carriers and that we are thermostats and not thermometers. We alter the temperature. The Lord is going to set things up for us to be that light and that salt that he says we are. He's setting us up to manifest as the children of God. And I believe that God is about to move on our behalf in order for us to manifest like we were designed to manifest in creation. He's going to show the world who his children are. Romans 8, 18, yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. For all creation is waiting eagerly for that future day when God will reveal who his children really are. The whole earth is in travail, waiting on God to really reveal who his children really are, to reveal who's really saved and who's not. Today, I want to continue to prophesy a day coming when the way we believe that things can be, will be. There's an ultimate day coming. Y'all not helping me here. Where when the things that we believe can be, will be. Remember the promise is God is going to move by his spirit. That God is going to pour his spirit out on fl all flesh. I, I'm sure you may remember in Genesis how the spirit of God moved. But first the spirit was hovering. It was moving. And it was moving. Always moving. God is always moving. There are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, the Holy Ghost, these three are one. In the beginning was God, the Word with God. And so God is moving. He's always moving, waiting. The Spirit was hovering, moving, waiting on orders to move specifically in the earth. Genesis 1, 1 and 2. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God did what? Moved upon the face of the waters. The Spirit of God moved. The Spirit of God hovered. It was hovering. The Spirit of God was in the beginning with God. Darkness and chaos was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit moved. And the Spirit is moving today. The Bible said that it was brooding, literally waiting hovering waiting on a command to work the spirit was hovering and then the next verse says and then god said 
darkness and chaos and decadence and perversion and hatred and confusion is all over this land today and the spirit is hovering the spirit is waiting on somebody to speak so that he can move come on ezekiel one day looked out and it looked bad for the people of god the bones were dry and very dry he said this is my people but he said ezekiel prophesy to the bones the spirit is ready to move when you speak and Ezekiel prophesied to the bones and the bones came back together again the sinew the tissue the muscles and those bones stood on their feet like an exceeding great army but God said Ezekiel that ain't all spirit still waiting to move he said Ezekiel speak to the wind speak to the spirit and tell the spirit to feel good god almighty these people and then the spirit moved on these people and that army that looked like an army became an exceeding great army and i'm telling y'all today there are people who look like an army they got big buildings they got pretty choir robes they got all of the mechanics they got the big screens they got the loud microphones look like an army but there's something missing he said speak to the wind there's something missing the spirit is hovering but he's working to work in the hearts of people say to the people receive ye the Holy Ghost receive ye the power of God look at you sitting there look at you look at you you're not in any anticipation look at you you don't even know what I'm talking about look at you you're not connecting with that people who are spirit filled people connect to the things of the spirit and when somebody is offering an opportunity to connect with the spiritual things of God they might just stop the service and say preacher you shut up and get out of the way and let the Holy Ghost do what the Holy Ghost wants to do I'm gonna prove it to you and I'm out of here the spirit is looking for somebody to move on the spirit is looking on some for somebody to move through somebody to bring light out of order light out of disorder and darkness and chaos so here's my message when the atmosphere is right and revival comes there's some things that you can expect for sure here's some things five things that you can expect when the Spirit of God is moving on the people when the Spirit of God is moving on the people of God number one you can expect to see what you have never seen before come on this is about to get good I'm gonna shout and go home Jeremiah 33 3 says call to me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know can you see yourself dumbfounded surrounded by things that you only hope for but now you see y'all not getting this there's some things that God has promised us and and you never forgot about them but but you're gonna one day the Bible says when his spirit is moving you'll be you can see what you've never seen before but but here's key to it not just your heart got to be right not just you got to have a right relationship with God but if your heart is right and you got a right relationship with God you got to expect it uh, tell somebody you got to expect it uh, you've got to walk in expectancy you got to begin to believe to see what you've never seen before you got to expect it uh, I know God made me a promise on some things and some things I didn't let get before me I always saw first the kingdom of God but then one day it just kind of showed up uh, because down in my spirit I still walked in expectancy even though I didn't walk after it I didn't allow it to get me off the path I didn't allow it to become my main thing I didn't want the blessing more than I wanted to bless her but I always live in expectation that's why you got to run to your mailbox if you expect God to do something spectacular you got to run to the mailbox if you expect God to do something supernatural you got to answer your phone and if you can't answer your phone if you got all all these other people calling you then what kind of person are you are you magnet to draw them kind of people where you now blocking people you should never have to say I'm blocking this person now and blocking that person now you should have never given them your phone number to begin with I'm gonna go over here there's some people you wonder why everybody in your phone book now you threatening to block them and to cut them off but hell you accepted them as friends and you gave them your number you got them on Facebook and Instagram and everything else stop blocking people that you've already accept it stop blocking people that you've already called your friend I wish I had somebody the problem ain't with them the 
problem is with you, with your crazy self. But you can expect to see what you've never seen before. When the Spirit of God is moving and revival's in the land. Number two, you can expect your prayers to be answered. James 5 and 6, confess your transgressions, uh, trespasses to one another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. And he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth produced this room. Some of us need to realize that we can expect our prayers to be answered. Stretch your hands right now. Just lift your hands to God and call this name with me. Tony Williams, say it. Tony Williams. Come on, say it. Tony Williams. Tony is my son. Tony's in ICU. Tony is battling for his life. But God is the giver of life. God is the giver of breath. Come on, God can say breath. Go and breath go into his lungs. Father, I thank you right now for Tony Williams. God raise him up and we can pray expecting to believe that God heard our prayer. Healing is the children's bread. Mental disorders, we can pray for them children uh, getting saved pray for them COVID period we've got to believe that we can pray and that God can move now take those hands and put them together and thank God for the healing of Tony Williams now when the spirit is moving uh, and revival is in the land number three you can expect a worship like you've never experienced before this is going to get good. Uh, Second Chronicles chapter 5. Uh, you hear this band over here? Uh, let me hear some cymbals. Uh, and let me hear some keys. Uh, and let me hear some guitar. And let me hear something over there. Because Second Chronicles chapter 5, uh, verse number 13 says, The trumpeters uh, and singers uh, perform together in unison to praise and give thanks to the Lord, uh, accompanied by trumpets, uh, cymbals, and other instruments. They raise their voice and praise the Lord uh, with these words. Uh, he is good. Uh, his faithful love endures forever. At that moment, a thick cloud uh, filled the temple of the Lord. And the priests uh, could not continue their service because of the cloud. For the glorious presence of the Lord filled the temple of God. Did y'all see that? When the band got on one accord, uh, when the singers got on one accord, when the dancers got on one accord, when the congregation of singers got on one accord, uh, God have mercy. When it all happened, uh, a cloud uh, filled the room uh, to where the ministers could not even minister. The priests could not even share the word. Uh, the glory, uh, the glory of the Lord filled the temple. Uh, good God Almighty, when there's revival in the land, uh, when the Spirit of God is moving, there's going to come a time uh, when it's all going to come together. And the glory, uh, the power of God uh, is going to fill his sanctuary. The power of God. God, uh, it's going to show up. Uh, you're not going to come in looking for nobody. You won't see nobody because of the cabal, uh, because of the cloud, uh, because of the glory. God says, I want the glory. I want you to see me. Uh, we will see Jesus. Uh, we need the glory. We need the power. We need the majesty. We need the might. Uh, around the throne, they shout, holy, holy, holy. Lord God Almighty. They say their am uh, that was slain from the foundation of the world they say glory and honor and power and might and dominion be unto God they realize it's all about God the glory will fill the temple singers got to sing in key dancers got to dance on beat musicians got to play in harmony good God Almighty the songs of the Lord have got to be hymnal they got to sing about the majesty the glory the honor of God. And when we direct our attention uh, to the one that this is all about, the glory of the Lord uh, will fill the temple. The glory of the Lord uh, is coming back to his house. Uh, for the glory of the latter house uh, shall be more glorious than the former house. Uh, the glory, uh, things that you've seen happen uh, in the house of God. Uh, you're going to see them in greater power, in greater might, uh, in greater majesty because of the glory. Now, now number four, when revival is in the land, you can expect to literally expect to see what you have 
never seen before. First Chronicles, uh, Corinthians 2, 9. Uh, but as it is written, come on, age, I have not seen, uh, nor ear heard, uh, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God have prepared uh, for them that love him. Uh, the day is coming. When we're going to say, I told you, a day is coming when we, what we've been promised will be in our hands. What folks said was impossible. We're going to be able to show them that what was impossible with man is possible with God. Come on, I need about 15 people who you haven't seen what it is that God has said you're going to have. I have not seen, ear have not heard. Not as it entered into the hearts, the things that God have in store. You ain't seen nothing yet. Tell somebody you ain't seen nothing but last but not least I'm gonna get out of here and rest my tired body when there's revival and spirit and when the spirit of God is at work number five you can expect to give like you've never given second chronicles uh, Corinthians 9 6 remember this whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly and whoever sows generally will also generously will also reap generously each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give not reluctantly or under compulsion for God loves a cheerful giver for God is able to make all grace abound to you so that in all things at all times having all that you need you will abide in every good work some folk you can't wait to get back to where you can start throwing money on the altar some people when I'm preaching they don't know whether they can get up in COVID and walk down and put nothing on an altar people like to sow in the middle of the move of God people like to sow when God speaks to them. People like to respond when God says something. It's almost like in response to what you've already given. And there's something about giving hilariously. God have mercy because when you give, that thing will come back to you and you'll look up and say, I got to give some more. The more I give, the more he gives to me. I wish I had somebody. So when the spirit is moving, oh, I got one more. You can expect to praise God like you have never praised him before. Second Samuel 6, 14. Then David danced before the Lord with all his might. And David was wearing a linen ephod. Psalm 150. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty firmament. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the lute and harp. Praise him with the timbrel and dance. Praise him with the string instruments and flutes. Praise him with the loud cymbals. Praise him with the clashing cymbals. Let everything, let everything, let everything that have breath praise you, Lord. So why should we praise God as we close this service? You ought to praise him. You ought to praise him for what you have never seen before because it's coming to pass. You ought to praise him because God is a prayer answering God. He's going to answer our prayer. You ought to praise him because the glory of the Lord is thick in the house of God. You better praise him because of what you've never had before and praise him because you've given like you've never given before and you can see what God will do when you obey him and give him. So I need about 55 people out there who realize that your life is caught up, tangled up, wound up in God and in him you live, move and have your being. He's all you need and everything you need. You love him with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. You love your neighbor as yourself. You got a right heart with God, a right relationship with God, and you know that God is ready to move, and you don't want to miss the move of God. If that's you, and you know God's going to do all these things for us, then in advance, don't wait till the battle is over. Shout right now. Shout. 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 Shout! Shout right now! Shout right now! Shout right now! Shout right now! Thank you! Thank you! Thank you! Thank you! Thank you! Throw your head back! Reach way down! And Amen! We pray you were blessed by the worship experience here at the Potter's House. Make sure you share this word with a loved one on your timeline and newsfeed. And remember, there are five ways that you can give. 
First, you can give by text by simply texting the word GIVE to 904-601-1695. Follow the prompts and you will receive a confirmation text of your gift. You may also give online at tphim.org backslash give. You can give through our Ministry One or Ezekiel Church app by downloading the app and following the instructions to give. Or you can mail in your gifts addressed to TPHIM at 5119 Normandy Boulevard, Jacksonville, Florida, 32205. Once again, we thank you for your continued generosity to the Potter's House. And for those of you who have answered the call to salvation, please call or text us at 855-TPH-4JAX. That's 855-874-4529. And until the next time, remember to share this message and stay connected via Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube channel at TPH Jax. May God bless you and keep you until our next digital gathering. 